So in a few minutes, uh, we're going to hear from my dad, Charles Eisenstein, about the next five years. Um, yeah. First, uh, a bit of context um, for folks who are coming just for tonight. Um, this, this, this is kind of a weekend retreat going on, so many of the folk here are part of that, and many of the folk here are coming just for tonight's event. Um, and yeah, the next five years, that's like not that long from now, um, but it seems like times are turbulent and um, there's potential for things to change really fast, so this could be a, a, a pivotal next five years. And um, it also seems like it could go in a number of directions, right? Like, um, in, in one sense, things seem pretty bleak, and yet there's this sense of hope I have um, when I come to events like this, like, like last night, um, a bunch of us were, were up in the big building and we were just like hanging out and singing songs and the energy felt really light and um, then there was a moment where uh, everyone kind of went silent and waited and people, um, then someone broke the silence and shared a song from their heart and then after that, silence. And then someone else shared one from their heart and there was this really, really kind of um, sacred field of honoring the gifts people are sharing and that moment gave me a lot of hope for the world despite all of the all of the major catastrophes that's that seem to be on our hands right now and so I'm like like what's going on like why does that give me hope like we're just we're just we're just singing songs like what is that really doing um, so I'm kind of holding that question, like, like, yet it does, like it feels real, it feels like we're doing something real, so, so, so like what implications does something like that have for the next five years, this kind of building of community and seeing each other, um, how does that mesh with the intensifying crises we see in the world today, what path forward might be possible? Um, so hopefully we get answers. Come on up, Charles Eisenstein. Mm. I'm really happy to be back here in Asheville and just like kind of looking for familiar faces. Uh, you know, we, we spent three years here, and a little piece of my heart is still here. And those, those moments that Jimmy was talking about, where whatever despair, whatever um, impossibilities that that we carry, that are narrated to us about how things, practically speaking, never are going to change. The forces arrayed against change are too powerful. And disaster is already locked in. Like all of that reasoning, somehow in those moments of, of, of musical expression or, or deep intimacy, Somehow, they don't seem relevant anymore. You're in another reality. What's happening now is that we are toggling back and forth between two, you could call them two realities, two timelines, two futures. And also, as you, I'm sure you have noticed, two, or more than two, beings to consciousnesses. When we ask this question, so, you know, I, I titled it The Next Five Years, um, which is a little bit of a trick uh, because people are, will, will come in thinking I'm going to talk about what's going to happen in the next five years. <laughs> Here's my, my prediction for the future. 
and here's this trend and that trend, and, and you know, I'm gonna, gonna predict what's gonna happen. But that mentality, that basic assumption that the future is something that we can predict, there's, I don't know if you can feel a, a, a subtle sense of disempowerment there. Because it means that it's gonna happen regardless of what any of us choose. Because that's what the future is going to be. All these big trends and all these big actors and all these powerful forces. It, that, that assumption rejects the felt understanding that everybody from time to time experiences that your personal actions, your personal choices, have planetary significance. And that in that little gathering of musicians, something significant is happening. And it, and it means something for the future. So there's another source of knowledge that I want to bring into the conversation, to bring into even our cognitive apparatus in order that we can make sense of the world. So the, that knowledge that felt experience of significance in our most private and personal choices and interactions and relationships is a key piece of information. It is not something that leads us astray. And what it communicates is that neither the future nor the present circumstances that create the future are a given. They're not something outside of ourselves. But what we call reality is in a constant, intimate co-arising with ourselves. And if somebody says, what's going to happen over the next five years? There's actually two ways to take that question. One way is as an invitation to make a prediction. The other way is as an invitation to tell you what it's going to be. Like, like if, I, if, if, I don't know, to take a simple example, if, if Stella says, what are we going to do tomorrow? My wife, Stella, um, who's sitting right there. Um, that one behind, <laughs> behind Patsy, my former wife. And um, Glenn sitting next to her, who's a, a relation that doesn't have a name right now. Um, but I don't know, what do you call the husband of your former wife? It's like, it's, I mean, it's, it's, we need a word for that. It's some kind of brother. Um, yeah, brother in love. Brother in love, yeah. Yeah. So... Mm. Yeah, where was I? <laughs> Stella. Yeah, tomorrow. So, so if she says, what are we going to do tomorrow? I don't take that as an invitation to make a prediction, do I? I'm, I'm like, okay, yeah, thank you for asking. Let's do this. Let's create the future. And so I want to pose that as the question, what is the next five years going to be? Because as Jimmy said, we are at a pivotal moment. You could say as uh, a item of metaphysical dogma that we are in choice all the time, always choosing the path that we will take. But in fact, most of our lives are the automatic result of certain choices we made in pivotal, pivotal moments that programmed a series of events. But there are special moments where we are actually in choice. Those are the moments when the unconscious becomes conscious, where habits that had been invisible become visible. And you have the opportunity to choose consciously either to continue what you have been 
or to make a different choice. And we are in a moment like that when a lot of the automatic programs, the, the ways of life, the institutions have broken down. They're in a state of collapse. They're disintegrating. This happened, uh, this, this, this accelerated during COVID where we got a preview of what the future was gonna be if we don't make any changes. Because none of, the, none of what happened during the lockdowns was actually anything new. The obsession with safety, the migration of life online, the medicalization of life, the intermediation of technology into all of our relationships, uh, even the intensifying polarization of wealth. None of this was new. The, the surveillance, the censorship, it was all starting before then. But we got kind of a, a fast forward, we got a preview of what the world is gonna be if we don't make a choice. And by being granted that preview, we are offered a choice. As we enter, it's not like things are ever going to go back to normal. We get little hints of little, little, um, little, little glimpses of, of maybe normals coming back. But I think most people understand in this room that the crises that are rising to meet us, ecological crises, social crises, moral crises, economic crises, these were created over decades or even centuries. They're not gonna go away by themselves. The, the storyline that we have entered and that is reaching its climax at this time needs to be completed. That story needs to be told to its fulfillment. Hope I'm not being too abstract here. What I wanna say is that we are entering an accelerated stage of a kind of a collapse, but I don't necessarily mean a collapse in the supply chain or the food system. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, and I want to acknowledge the part of, part of me and the part of many people that kind of want that to happen as a form of liberation from what we're stuck in. But the collapse, really, that's a kind of a projection screen for what really is collapsing is sense and meaning and identity. The narratives that told us what a human being is and how to live life and, how the, how, and what America is and what the world is and, and what's real even and how to change things and how to be a good person and how to live a successful life. Who you are, why you're here, all of that is unraveling. And that is an extremely disorienting process. And there are uh, a lot of, of, of pitfalls in this time that I call the space between stories. The gathering here is, uh, it's the gathering of, of an online community that we've um, cultivated over the last two years. And I, I use the word community in a generous sense I'm not sure if anything online can actually fully be a community. In fact, I'm sure that it cannot. But we have developed uh, some aspects of community. And the community, it's called a new and ancient story, dedicated to, what, to, to participating in a new story that also has very ancient roots, a new story that answers the questions I just listed. Who am I? What's real? What's important? What's valuable? How do I live life? Where did I come from? Why am I here? All of that. A new story. And the, and, and 
the consciousness that goes along with that story because the story is just the outer layer of something much more total, something that's in the body, something that's in the ground, something that's in the blood, something that's in the heart. It includes every aspect of our being. That is the depth of the transition that we are approaching. And, and so the online community was dedicated and is still. Um, it's going through a metamorphosis, um, dedicated to the principle of reverence. Reverence in communication, which is not often found online. <laughs> reverence being not simply a virtue to aspire to, but actually the result of a way of seeing the human being, seeing the divine, the life in each person, and communicating with that awareness that I am speaking to life incarnate. I am speaking to spirit made flesh. And this person is doing and saying what life does and says in the totality of their circumstances. That, that way of seeing a human being is seeing the truth. That's reality. Sanity is to be in reality. That's the pivot now that I'm making to, um, well, it's going to be a six-month online, kind of want to call it a, a program, but not really, because um, it's more than just a program, but it's called the Sanity Project. And that is one of the truths, one of the points of the real that we will practice in the Sanity Project. The question, and why am I doing the Sanity Project now? It's simply because of the turbulent times that Jimmy referred to, the breakdown of sense and meaning that can drive you crazy. And that leaves us susceptible to going crazy. There were times during COVID, actually, where I felt like I was going crazy. Where I was, you know, holding, holding a story that so contradicted what the culture overall was saying and thinking and appearing to believe, that there were times where I thought, well, maybe I'm the crazy one. And where I really went, went to like maybe every single thing I've done in my entire career was simply coming from my reflexive opposition to my father and my discontent. And I just couldn't hack it in the, in the, in the real world, so I became a dissident. And like all of this, this is one of the pitfalls I'm talking about here. When your truth is so different from what prevails that, that you are toppled from the seat of the soul. The robbers get into the castle, the bandits get in, they run amok, and you become a fugitive in your own castle with your hidden truth skulking around not daring even to say it to yourself, but on some level still knowing this can't be right. And so during those times, I always came back again and again to what, what do I know for real from my direct experience? Because I had even started doubting my direct experience. I'd started gaslighting myself. And how many of us, maybe every one of us, 
have these direct experiences that contradict what we are being told about what is real and what is important. It's almost inevitable. For one thing, the economy tells us what is important. The economy tells us what is valuable. The economy, through where the money is, says here is what society values and here's what it does not value. And so much of what we know in our bodies is valuable, is not economically rewarded. We were talking today in our morning session about this, the, the invisible people doing the humble work, taking care of children, the, the, the enormous number of children who are um, mentally or physically disabled, who have chronic diseases, who turn the lives of their parents into one seemingly endless caregiving ordeal that, yes, has its joys and rewards, but this isn't what you thought your adult life was going to be. There are so many people behind these closed doors who have that experience, and they're pouring their love and, and, and building their patience and in a deep practice and trying so hard, and they're not even celebrated or thanked for it, and they're certainly not valued for it. In a new and ancient story, we recognize the value of these devotional, humble people. They know that this is the most important thing that they could be doing to care for this being. How do you stay sane in that knowing if you don't have help? If you don't have other people to affirm what you know as the right choice. And that's the key to the sanity project. And that is the key to maintaining sanity in coming times. I like to say sanity is a group project. We cannot hold a story alone. We need a community to hold a reality. Because as I said, reality is not an objective thing outside of ourselves, a given, neither the present nor the future. It is a relationship. And I'm not saying that we create it, by the way. That, that is a, a new age distortion. We don't create it. We are offered it. We are given it. And our choice is whether to say yes or no to the future and the present that is offered to us. And through our yes and no, we create ourselves. Who am I to be? Also not a given. That is the essence of what sovereignty is. Who am I to be? And therefore, through that choice, through that acceptance of the offering, here is who you can be. Through the, that acceptance, through that choice, we also create the world that is an intimate mirror of ourselves. So part of why I'm here and doing this work is to be part of that collective holding of sanity and to invoke realities and states of being that I think many of us are ready and willing to step into. And we all need a little help from each other to do that. The challenges ahead as the old structures break down and we are left alone in the gale, maybe even the, the and we start gaslighting ourselves and, and that, that truth that maybe we, we, we touched in certain moments, it, it, 
it, it's, it blows away in the cloud, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the gusts, leaving us susceptible to um, predatory substitutes for the structures of sense, meaning, and identity that have fallen away. Because the, the, the story that, that I grew up in, anyway, was a totalizing story. It explained everything from, from you know, what is the origin and purpose of humanity to why do the birds sing? And when that breaks down, there's, there, there's even a sense of vertigo. and a, therefore a, a, an intense discomfort and a desperation to find some substitute, a new story of everything in which we can rest. And that's what I call going insane. So, one way to hold it all together is to become even more entrenched and more orthodox in the story that it's breaking down. Even though it's not working, I'm gonna double down and believe in it more. This is actually a classic response to a challenge to a worldview. They've done studies about this. You know, they present people with evidence that contradicts their worldview, and then they interview them about the result of that challenge, and most people become more convinced of their worldview when it is challenged because it's an assault on your identity, you know? Opinions aren't just opinions, they're woven into everything, to your, to your, to your self-worth. And, and so that's one response, is you get even more entrenched, which requires that you ignore more and more of what's real. In order to believe, for example, right now, that civilization is basically on the right track, and that science and technology are ushering in a better and better world every year. What do they think of next? Like that whole, that whole mythos. You have to ignore more and more things to actually think that's true. <laughs> in the 50s, if you were a typical, you know, white middle class person, it was very easy to believe. Even if you were a black person in the 60s, you know, we're, we're fixing it civil rights, you know, and environmentalism, and, and we're on the right track. There was an incredible um, optimism at that time that was betrayed, um, and we took a different path. There was, that was a, a timeline that was alive in the 60s. Some of you can remember it. The optimism, the can-do spirit. And I can tell you the date that we entered a different timeline. November 22nd, 1963. Everybody who was alive then remembers where they were on that date when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And on some level, people felt the timeline shift. We can even feel it now. And that new timeline was cemented into place over the next five years with the assassinations of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Robert F. Kennedy. And since then, and you know, the JFK assassination especially was such an obvious conspiracy and the official story was so obviously absurd that it was actually, it was almost on purpose that it was that absurd because it offered us a choice. Will you believe a blatant lie? And collectively we said yes. That lie has been like, you know, if you inhale a speck of plutonium, it just generates cancer, 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 cancer. That's been like that. It's been like this, this radioactive poison inside the body politic ever since. Because once you accept that lie, you start to accept all the other lies that are required to maintain it. And the result is that we live in a matrix of lies right now. 
where we take it for granted being lied to. We take it for granted. We're not shocked when, when politicians lie to us. It's normal. Advertising, it's one lie after another. We automatically discount all speech, which is part of the reason for speech inflation, where we're, everything's like awesome, like all these superlatives, because we're, we're, we're discounting things. You know, so that, yeah, that, that, that timeline, <laughs> the lost timeline, that was truncated in 1963 actually isn't lost. This is why I've, I've gotten involved in um, the presidential campaign of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah, his, you know, I never thought that I would ever be involved in politics because I thought that my, my thinking was so far removed from anybody who would be a serious candidate that, like, you know, this would not happen in my lifetime. And I've just been stunned, like shocked at the receptivity, you know, not just to my clever ideas about strategy, but like to the deep, primarily, the, the, theme of healing the divide and <clears throat> looking at 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 issues from outside the frozen debate you know everybody's saying what's your position on you know guns on abortion on immigration on etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. here's your choices on israel on china on russia on ukraine here's your choices and what I am representing and, and holding uh, and finding resonance with is we don't have to accept those choices. We can look for a deeper unity underneath the divisions. <clears throat> so anyway, this isn't a campaign speech, but it is, <clears throat> um, you know, everything is all, all tied together in, for me. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so I, I went into that whole diversion because I was talking about this, this story that has carried us falling apart and it's becoming harder and harder to ignore that. And so in order to ignore it, you essentially have to go crazy. You have to be insane to hold on to the orthodoxy. Okay, so that's one alternative, okay? That's one path to madness. Another path to madness is to jump to another totalizing discourse that explains everything. And it could be religious fundamentalism. It could be a cult. It could be conspiracy theories. And when I say conspiracy theories, I do not mean that in a derogatory sense because I do think that actual conspiracies happen and have a bigger influence on affairs, current affairs than we think, than most people think, than maybe not people in this room, but. Um, <laughs> and you know, conspiracy theory can be used to, to dismiss any dissent, any, any you know, unorthodox opinion, any protest. Uh, but when the conspiracy theory offers you an explanation for everything, be careful. So these are, these are all, oh, and then another form of madness is nihilism. It's to become attached to the space between stories, which is really supposed to be a transition. It's, it's a, a deprogramming time. It's a letting go. And it does take some time. A gentle falling away of what you thought was real and who you thought you were. 
That's the empty space that allows something new to be born. It's also why I like to take pauses in my speaking. so that I don't go on autopilot so something new can be born. So yes, we are at a crossroads indeed, a choice point. Multiple timelines converge on the present moment. And you can feel them sometimes. You can feel maybe, feel yourself moving from one to another to another which kind of explains what what Jimmy was saying about, about, you know, how can I feel so much despondency at one moment and feel so much hope at another moment? It's because you're actually occupying a different timeline toward a different future. So the task in front of us in the next five years is to first recognize the choice that we are making and learn how to solidify the timeline that we actually want to experience for ourselves and the future generations. How do you actually make this choice? It's not just to check a box. It's to recognize the moments that we are choosing it. One way to do that is facing a choice, ask, What declaration am I making about human nature? What am I saying about the human being by making this choice? What do I affirm as here's what a human being does when faced with this kind of situation? Every one of you who has chosen kindness, Patience, compassion, love, and even the smallest conditions, the smallest situation, the most invisible situation with a baby, with a dying person even. You are issuing a prayer. You are establishing a principle of reality. You are engaging in a creative act. You are affirming this is what a human being does in these situations. And you are strengthening a field that everybody from Elon Musk to to Vladimir Putin to, to anybody you can imagine is standing in that field. And the more that we establish it, the more we find that people who we think of as powerful, when they're faced with these situations, they'll make the the choice that is in line with the choices we made. This is how we establish the field of reality. This is how we answer the question, what will the next five years be? What will the next 50 years be? What choice will we make in this time? And that is not to say, don't worry about the political world, don't worry about the world outside, just focus on the inner, just focus on the spiritual. It's to say that all of these are on a continuum and to trust that we're, that, that, here's another aspect actually of what we call the new and ancient story, that there is an intelligence that orchestrates and organizes all things and places us in the conditions where we have 
the opportunity to say yes or no to the next story that our soul has been offered. There is a, 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 there is a plan that, don't want to get too like metaphysical here, but there is a, yes I do actually, I like doing that. Um, <laughs> But I, I will say that this is only one way to narrate it, okay? But, you know, the idea that your soul before your lifetime makes the plan, plans out. It doesn't plan out your choices, the choices you will make. It plans out the opportunities that you will have to make those choices. So there is an incredible, like you sit down with God and you make a plan. And so there's an incredible intelligence to where we are placed in the matrix of being and relationship. And sometimes, especially when <clears throat> where you are placed doesn't come with recognition and celebration and thanks and doesn't fit into your received notions about what is important and what makes change in the world, it can be hard to trust that intelligence. But we don't have any, we haven't the foggiest idea of how change happens in the world. It is a complete mystery. Anyone who has experienced synchronicity in your life knows that it is a complete mystery. That's been a big theme here in our time together. Um, the, the idea of, of synchronicities as signs that, like, that, that the timeline is, 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 is shifting. It's like you have to be, it's like in the matrix, you know, you have to be pulled out so that a new program can be implemented and then you're stepped back in again. And you notice maybe when you experience a synchronicity, there's a feeling of wonder. There's a feeling of being in the presence of God, in the, in the presence of this orchestrating intelligence. You're taken out of the story for a moment. You're taken out of the story so that a new one can be installed. <clears throat> and so here, if I want to make any prediction for the next five years, I will make a prediction that you will experience a lot of synchronicity. <laughs> and those synchronicities come with a choice. This new program will only be installed with your consent. So yeah, the, and as I was saying, the, 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 you know, on a, for many of us, it can be hard to trust the orchestrating intelligence when it doesn't conform to our ideas of what a change maker looks like. And I'm saying to you, those ideas are misleading and obsolete. And we are moving into a story where we recognize and affirm what the heart already knows about the significance of those labors of love that so many humble people, especially the mothers and the grandmothers, have been performing for so long, not valued economically, not celebrated, but doing the important work that holds the fabric of reality together, that makes it even possible for the supposedly big change makers to do their work. They're drawing on this field. And the more, every time we say yes, we enter a little bit more into that New timeline, the one that has surfaced from time to time in human history. Most recently in the United States in the 1960s, other times too in human history, that gave people even the conception of a more beautiful world, of, of a great society of utopia. And it's surfacing again right now in these darkest of times. 
which will probably get darker and more unstable in coming years. But what will have changed with each choice, even on the most invisible personal level, what will have changed is that we'll realize that we have actually turned around. We have begun the return journey into an age of reunion. And as token of that, you will have more and more confirmations. Things that happen that, and things that you perceive and experience that did not exist in the reality that you had been. Literally did not exist. One of our, our uh, uh, attendees at, the re at this retreat, uh, Nicholas, it was just talking to me at dinner about it, an experience he had um, not too long ago where he, he comes home and, and um, there's this gorgeous sunset and, and the birds are singing really loud and he's like, where are the birds? Where, where are all these birds, you know? And he's looking around and he looks up and looks up and looks up and there they are on the top of a tree. And in that moment, he knows like he is, he is informed that they're singing in praise of the sunset. In the story that I inherited, that's nonsense. In the story I inherited, there's, you know, some kind of um, mechanism in their hypothalamus or whatever birds have and the photons, you know, um, stimulate motor neurons which, you know, make their song come out more. But there, isn't, there, there wasn't room in the story that I grew up in for praise f from anybody but us. And therefore, there wasn't even room for praise from us. And we became alienated from, from beauty, from the divinity in, in, in all things. And instead related to earth as a source of things for us, as resources, as things, not as beings. And we became very lonely. The more that we were separated, the more lonely we became. The more crazy we got living in this world of images, this world of representations unmoored from reality, taking on a life of their own, doing the craziest things in this separate universe that had no connection to physical reality and human reality and biological reality to the point where that physical, human, material, biological reality is withering away. And the number of songbirds has decreased by 80%. Because, but let me turn it around. Why is that happening? We could talk about all of the habitat destruction and insect loss and climate change and all that. But really why it's happening is because they need to be praised even to continue existing. The function of a human being is twofold. And those of you who are here, I think this morning, I, I apologize for saying it again, but I say it to myself every day, so it's twofold, the function of a human being, why we were born here on Gaia wasn't a mistake. We weren't Gaia's big mistake that, that if we only exited this planet, life would be better off. What an insult to the mother that would be to think that. Now we are here really for the same reason 
that all beings are here, but we do it in a unique way. We are here twofold. One is to behold the magnificence and the beauty of life, of creation, to behold it and to praise it, to delight in it, to receive the gift. It's a gift. That's the origin of the thread in the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic tradition of the necessity to praise God, you know? To praise creation. When we don't do that, creation begins to wither away. When we hold it as dead, as modern ideology has, it becomes dead. We see that unfolding all around us. To turn it around, we have to accept the gift. It's not hard. And then we see it as sacred. And then we, are, we enter into reverence. Again, respect for nature, reverence for nature. It's not something you have to shame or guilt somebody into wielding your, your disdain and social pressure to make them do something they don't want to do. No. It's, to, it's, it's out of a generosity. My brother, my sister, accept the gift. I mean, how, how nourishing it is to hear those bird songs and how poor we feel when they're not available. What an impoverished society we live in when we get just such a tiny little shred of the nourishment that human beings were once surrounded in, immersed in. So that's one aspect of our purpose, to receive. The other one is obviously to give. And it is moved by the reception, by the gratitude, to contribute to more life, more beauty, more sacredness, so that others may receive what we have received and that all life may thrive. It's obvious. Yeah, I'm glad someone agrees with that. <laughs> so, you know, I ha you, you'll notice I haven't really said, okay, here's what the new story is. And if we believe that, then we're sane. I'm really... That's not necessary to do that. Everybody understands what I'm talking about now. And I think you understand what I mean by the choices that often follow a synchronicity. The choice to say yes or to say no. Also to say no. Because we're going to be offered a lot of realities, a lot of timelines that should not be walked in my view. There's one of bloody revolution and vengeance against the elites that have, that have committed such atrocities and such horrors. Uh, there's a timeline where they get all sent to the guillotine or whatever the modern equivalent is. But we know actually what the end of that story is. They're the first to get sent to the guillotine, but they're not the last. But that is a strong offering, vengeance, vindication, punishment. But there's a much better choice than that. And all of us will be offered that choice. Will you choose vengeance or will you choose healing? 
Would you rather that the perpetrator be punished or would you rather that it never happens again? Sometimes it seems that punishing the perpetrator will ensure that it never happens again. But there will come a choice point where it's not just about preventing the perpetrator from causing harm again, it's about punishing. And, once, and there will be a choice point. Whatever version of that is for you, and that's just one of the choices. So there, there is a, a no and there is a yes. That is what we will be faced with in the next five years. Because, and, and these will have global significance, the choices that we make. And <laughs> let me just t talk about the paradox here. Well, what if I make the choices for this timeline and you know, she makes the choices for that timeline? Then what happens, Charles? <laughs> Doesn't work like that. That's, that's the Cartesian mind, the modern mind, trying to make sense of, of this. You could say that in the reality that I affirm through my choices and that I choose through my choices, the choice that Patsy makes will also be in alignment with that reality and so will everybody else's choice. I'm choosing a reality in which those people make those choices. And when I see them making other choices, first thing I do is, hmm, how am I also making that choice? Maybe even in some very subtle homeopathic form. And so this is, you know, the, the, the theme that I've kind of introduced into the campaign, not as an official thing, and maybe I don't even say it out loud, but energetically for sure. The America that almost was, and yet may be, And it's more than the America. It's the whole world. This is, again, not a campaign speech, although there will be a possibility that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is going to come to Asheville, I think, on October 28th. Um, so uh, how will people find out about that? Maureen? Where's Maureen? Yeah. No, not Marie, Maureen. This is a... Ma... Maureen, yes. Yeah, uh, the group of us hosting Bobby Kennedy on October 28th. And we, we just need and would love everyone to be involved in that. So we haven't found a venue yet, but it's a fundraiser. And so we need everyone to participate and contribute and support the more beautiful world that we're all going to create together. Thanks. So, so yeah, um, anyway, if you do want to find out about it, if I like, keep posted, the website for the whole campaign is kennedy24.com, where you can you know, sign up for updates or donate money, um, the proverbial lifeblood of the campaign. Um, so anyway, I did want to mention that. Um, And to return also, to the awareness of this choice point, not just in the, the story of America, but, but in the world and even, you know, in the cosmos, not, not to like be grandiose about it, but it is a significant moment. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no different in, in really from anybody else here in, I've shared a little bit about my struggles to stay sane. Those moments where I thought maybe I've been just a parasite on the world. And in those moments, coming out of it, not through my own power, but because somebody said the right thing to me at the right time. 
and saw me and affirmed what was true in me. This is the work that I would send you forth doing to affirm what a human being is in your relations with others, to speak to that part of them, the true part of them that is here to praise, to receive, and to give, and to create. To know that is true of everybody, even the ones who you have judgment of, especially the ones you have judgment of, because when you see it and you know it, it becomes true. That's the shape-shifting. That's the shift in timelines. It becomes true because you say it's true. That's called prophetic speech. Prophetic speech does not work if it isn't already true. You cannot speak something into existence if it's not already true in some way, in potential, if there's not already a timeline in which it is true. To, to say it, you have to see it. It's not dogma. To see it, you have to know that it's there. And what I'm doing here is to invoke that knowledge, that it's already there. So, what I would like to do now You're very welcome. I have this idea. I just feel like it's going to be really loud, though. If everybody's talking at once. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, okay. Hmm. All right. So you'll um, <clears throat> establish a connection with somebody next to you to have a conversation, okay? Could be the person you came with. Just make sure everybody's got somebody. And if you've been left out, then you could raise your hand and find somebody else who was left out. Or you could witness a conversation. Okay, but don't start talking yet. <laughs> I want to structure this a little bit. Okay. Um, one of you. Okay, first decide which of the two of you is the most cynical. <laughs> okay. If you can't... <laughs> Shh. Boy, that's fun. I mean, what if, what if we even had like a whole conversation about who's the most cynical? <clears throat> yeah, we could have like a whole workshop about that. But uh, there's a reason why I'm asking you this, so please give me your attention again. Shh, 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 shh. Yeah. We hopefully have some professional librarians here who are good at shh. Okay, so the one of you who is less cynical will embody your cynical side, your, your uh, despairing side, your crazy side, <clears throat> and you will come at the cynical person <clears throat> with whatever bursts out of you when you are in despondency 
when you are in doubt, when you think that there's no hope, when you're grumpy, when you're down on human beings, <clears throat> and, and <clears throat> from that place, issue a challenge or ask a question. Maybe even a question, you know? Like one of those questions, well, you know, given the methane releases in the Arctic, how is it even possible that we're gonna, okay. <clears throat> something like that, you know? Um, something that comes from the cynicism that ignores the knowledge that Jimmy invoked in that gathering of musicians when the silence descended and then somebody sang from the heart. Speak from the place that doesn't know what was known in that moment. Because most of us visit that place sometimes. Most of us forget sometimes because we have not yet established critical mass. We're working on it right now. Okay, the cynical person gets to embody that knowledge of possibility, of sovereignty, of choice, and speaks from the timeline that they choose in their best moments, and speaks from the knowledge that arrives at the body level when the silence has descended and someone sings from the heart. And your answer may meet the question on its own terms, or maybe it won't. Maybe it will address the question behind the question. Maybe it won't be an answer. But you will know what to do. And so we will, I, I ask, because there's so many of us here, um, it won't take too long, a couple of minutes, but it's powerful. It's powerful. So first, take a minute in silence. The questioner prepares the question, taps into the cynical side, taps into the side that forgets sometimes. And in silence for another minute, the person responding touches into the knowledge of a more beautiful world. Okay. In one minute, I will signal you to begin the conversation. Okay, my, my inner librarian is saying shh. Okay, because we're not starting the conversation yet. Really? Take a minute to um, take a minute to orient to this role. Because you will be speaking not only on behalf of yourself. Okay, we're doing a little bit of magic here. A minute of silence, please. Then I will signal to begin. Thank you. Okay, begin your conversation. you can hear me, raise your hand and come into silence. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm sure there'll be time after for, for people to continue their conversations. Um, and I was going to have a Q&A right now. We have a mic set up, but I feel like all your questions have been answered by each other already, right? So. <laughs> Crowdsourced Q&A. But yeah, you know, like, like this, um, you know, a lot of times people say, say like, Charles, you're, you're putting words to things that I've been thinking, you know, that have been in my head the whole time. I'm like, yeah, 
like what I'm saying isn't actually new and the knowledge is accessible to everybody. All it takes is the right circumstances and the, the water table that is rising pours forth from every spring in this room. Uh, so that said, um, I will actually um, invite people to um, come up and offer, um, I would say, um, uh, questions and, and um, not like really long um, disquisitions on topics. But, but if it's questions or, or comments um, or something that's moving in you really strong, um, and then I will respond. So there's the mic. Hi, Charles. Um, on my spiritual path, we believe that this is the time of Kali Yuga, the Iron Age, where uh, truth become lies and lies become the truth. Everything's upside down. So I'm just curious as to how, if, if you are aware of that, you believe it, what you think that, what effect that has on the era that we're in and how, the next five years. Yeah. Because it seems like if that's the reality, how do, how do we change the, that reality? Yeah. So, you know, Kali Yuga, um, there's, there's depths upon depths of understanding that concept. And the most literal level, it's a literal succession of ages. You know, the golden age and this, the age and that age and ending up with the horrendous Kali Yuga. Um, but um, there are other ways to understand that. Um, such as each of those ages interpenetrates the others. Each of those ages exists as an, int as an integrity outside of the linear timeline and is refracted onto the linear timeline through the refra refracting lens of human co choices and human consciousness. So that all of the ages can coexist at the same time on Earth in different places, in different pockets, in different bubbles of reality. And each of those ages also corresponds to a state of consciousness that we can toggle in and out of many times a day. So that said, in certain places, in certain nations, in certain times, one or another of these archetypal ages ha ha will, will predominate. And, but the, the literal number of years and stuff like that, that, that is not really meant to be taken literally. Uh, long story short is that the succession of ages is not something happening outside of ourselves, separate from our participation that we are the victims of. Um, and we embody each of those ages and are part of their succession. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, I was invited yesterday, but I was like, I, I, I think I'd heard your name before, but I was like, I don't know. Yeah, I've been very, um, really deep in learning about the culture war and, and um, politics. I mean, I'm just so curious about how everything works. But so I was like, I, I need to listen to this guy's stuff just to make sure, because I don't want to go for you know two hours and pay money to, to listen to somebody who's, you know, whatever. So, and I, I listened to some of your stuff, and I really appreciated the the stuff you were specifically talking. Hope there weren't too many ads. On the and now, well, I've got, I do, I am, a, I have, what is it, YouTube Premium, so I never have it, so, yeah, but that's worth it for me. Um, but yeah, I really liked your videos on the f fundamentalism and the, the religious stuff, because it was so, it was like, oh, he's going to talk about, generally when we hear religion, we talk about Christianity, but you were talking more about, um, like, cultism and, like, this kind of, like, tribalist thinking, and I don't know if these words are the most accurate, but I really appreciated the way that you communicated it during those interviews that you were doing. I feel like you were, at, at the moment when you were saying it, it was like, wow, this would, I feel like this would get past the, 
intense like barrier and uh, protectiveness of people who are somewhat captured by the ideology of, of I mean, you did use the the woke or the you know like the the progressive kind of Maoist of like equity and I don't know. It's just I feel like this anger is like kind of that's been the part. Like for me, I'm like the 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 right. It's like really easy to see like when they've gone off the rails, and so. I appreciated the way that you were able to communicate the other side of like, what is the soft person if they get too much power? How does it go too far? Yeah. So I'll, make, I'll end it yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so that that skill in in communication is actually really not so much a matter of skill. It's a matter of um, looking to where the divisive opinions come from and speaking to the uh, underlying moral being um, and respecting people and taking them seriously and, and, and as a gesture of respect, speaking in their language, you know? If I, you know, go to Mexico, I'm not going to just be like shouting, I'm an American, listen to me, all right, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like at least try to, try to learn a little bit of their customs, learn their ways, um, maybe learn their language a bit. And, and, and so that's when I'm speaking to Christians or people who identify as politically progressive or people who identify as politically conservative. I, I learn a little bit of their language so that I can translate transpartisan concepts into words that they can receive. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And sometimes it's very hard because, because the reflex that has been instilled in us is to filter every piece of information through the filter of, is he on our side or their side? Like, that's the first question people ask. So sometimes the skill comes in confusion. <laughs> like, you know, be, be uncategorizable. Say something that just doesn't fit. And then there's this, a moment where the guard comes down because people are, this is actually a classic uh, hypnosis technique. <laughs> Milton Erickson used to be able to hypnotize people with a handshake because he'd take their hand really weird. He'd like, you know, <laughs> stroke their thumb or do something weird and... and, and and like their, their, their mind would reorient and there'd be this openness. So it's kind of like that, you know, to, to be uncategorizable. And the way you do that is to, sp is to really speak to the, to the underlying um, soul. Um, you know, like, this is, I'll say a little bit more. I said this this morning, the way that the way that the power elite, the way that the establishment controls us is, is by directing our anger onto hate. By hijacking anger and channeling that energy onto hate. Hate for each other. Which neutralizes the anger. It's all directed against itself and leaves the system untouched, leaves the real causes of what is making us angry untouched. The most powerful revolutionary prerequisite is to learn a new habit. Stop using that filter. Which side are they on? Hold your anger so sacred that you will not allow it to be converted into hate. Hi, Charles. Thank you so much. Um, first, thank you for being brave during COVID. When you came on the scene and started speaking up, it was right when my husband and I really needed to hear you speak up. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry to get emotional about it, but thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> As a parent, I'm just wondering if you have any tips for helping 
protect, but also prepare our children for these times. I have a four-year-old and a 10 and a half-year-old, and um, we've always been very much of the belief that we want them to be in the world, but not of the world, but that's getting harder and harder. <laughs> I swear once a month I want to pull my daughter out of her private school and homeschooler, and I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But I don't know if that's going to be in service to her because she was born now and she's dealing with these issues. So I'm not, sorry, I don't mean to get too personal about it, but do you have any advice for parents is my question. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I've, um, I'm on kid number four at this point, so <laughs> I do have some experience with this. Um, and, you know, with the older, older ones, um, for a lot of the time I was like really poor and didn't have a whole lot of choices, you know, and kind of did the best I could. Um, with Carrie, who's 10 now, we've been pretty much homeschooling. Uh, and the idea is to give him like such a solid foundation and such a, a strong core um, that he'll be able to go out into the world and stay sane, you know. To some extent, if you, if you pour enough love into them, because they are life, they'll know what to do. They'll, they'll navigate. Um, but I think that, you know, in the early formative years, homeschooling is a really good idea. Especially, but even better, I mean, you know, homeschooling in isolation isn't a good idea. Uh, and if you live in a place where there's not a lot of alternative culture, then it can be really hard. That was one of the dilemmas that I faced. Um, like homeschooling by yourself is so unnatural, you know? But if you can get a, a pod, homeschooling pod together, or also like, you know, Waldorf, you know, some of the alternative schools, forest, forest children, you know, those things. I'm here with the ultimate Waldorf teacher right back there, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, I think, you know, to, to, yeah, eventually they're going to step into society. I mean, that's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're here to do something about it. We're not here just to, to stay apart, you know. We're here, you know, if we were here to stay apart, we wouldn't have entered this realm to begin with, you know. So, but it's to prepare them yeah. for their, their work of enjoying and delighting in creation and contributing to it. That, but okay, um, Charles. I I was first learned of you through Zach Bush um, several years ago, and um, you've become to me a voice of sanity in a pretty insane world these last couple of years. So I want to say thank you for that. But I also I want to ask you a question about community, because it seems myself and almost everybody I know is seeking more community in this world. And I'd just like for you to comment what that looks like to you. Yeah. Um, community actually cannot be achieved when it is an end in itself. Community is a result of people doing something together that they care about. Giving their gift. Community is a matter of gifts. Um, it's, it's, it's woven together through gifts and mutual gratitude, mutual obligation, which isn't a bad thing obligation. Um, it's knowing, it, community is when you look at somebody and you know that I need them. I need you. I need you. Why do I need you? Maybe in a traditional context it was I need you to survive. But even in a traditional context it wasn't really that. Other cultures were not just here to survive. They had spiritual aspirations and an idea of good life, living well, that required everybody's participation. And today it's the same. 
if you are with people and you all care about something more than just yourselves, then you will make sacrifices toward that thing. And because everybody brings different gifts and capacities to the table, you know that I need you, not because I need you to survive, but I need you because I care about this thing a lot. And you do too. And your gifts are essential to this thing that I care about. Without that, then the community seems kind of superficial, you know? Like, okay, we're all living together. We're on land now. Now what? <laughs> I am in Asheville. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Let's get on land. Okay, why? Why? What, what do you care about that brings you to this land? Because, and this taps into that basic purpose like, we are here to do something, and we can't do it alone. So community is about finding the people who you're going to do it with. You know? Could be raising children in a beautiful way. Could be much more than that. I'd just like to say also, I was thrilled with your announcement on Monday. And um, it takes a lot of courage to step into the political arena, I believe. Um, for years, I have said I'm on the purple team. You put red and blue together and you get purple. And to me, that's the team of the people. And I believe that's where you are too. Yeah. I have just a small gift for you. Yeah, the... Uh Purple team. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, I'll just say, one of the most heartening things is the um, resonance of the campaign on both right and left. It's, it's you know, the other day I, we, we put out a, like there, there was an article on Counterpunch saying why the left should take RFK Jr. seriously. Counterpunch is like one of the most like hard left websites out there. And the same day, there was an article on, in, on um, the American conservative, um, why conservatives, you know, should support RFK Jr. So I'm like, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's hope here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Charles. Um, I actually have a kind of continuation from where you were just going, which is that, um, you know, first of all, thank you so much for stepping into that arena. You know, I imagine there's a lot of difficulty <laughs> in being in that, in that sphere. Um, but something that you said in your, your blog post announcing it, like, uh, really made me cry with, with joy and with hope where you said, you know, from where you're standing, um, RFK has a real chance, you know, and probably because of what you were just saying. And, but I think you also mentioned like powerful people that you are witnessing, you know, are behind this campaign. And I'm sure you can't like name names or anything like that. But um, I was just curious if you would share more about what you're seeing. Yeah, like powerful, like, like powerful people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you learn that these powerful people aren't as powerful as people think they are. But yeah, like defectors from the establishment who are fed up with the whole thing and desperate. And, um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be part of it if I didn't think I had a chance. And uh, I just, there's a recent poll, a Rasmussen poll, like a, you know, legit poll that had him among Democrats now at 33% or something which, you know, for a month after the campaign, and, and actually he has more support among independents and Republicans than Democrats. So, I mean, this is a totally legit thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as always, thank you for playing your part in the evolution of consciousness. Uh, you know, we say that the true majority is the disenfranchised. And I don't know, I'm sure there's at least a dozen of us here that overlap with the local sea keeling community. Anyone? Um, so lo it's the, the notion that most addictions are really part of the, this loneliness epidemic. So what I've always imagined is that the energy that's involved in a presidential campaign to actually essentially reach everyone 
if someone who has the grounding and lightning that you know is saying what is our common ground and so I guess the question really is is do you have a working definition for sanity and and then also if you could paint some sort of a picture of of the energy that was go, that goes into marketing campaigning deception decepticon game if all of that just went into infrastructure that created mutual aid for dealing with the crises we're facing that you are able to articulate in ways that people go wow I already thought of that and let's do this so I'd, I'd love to hear more of that, that that what yet may be part yeah just any any piece you can paint of like how like magically that like the, the most magical version if you could <laughs> of how the campaign unfolds yeah. uh, I, 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 I think I missed some element of the question uh, the most magical version of what of, of uh, this yeah, the 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 the, the re-enchanting of 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 uh, of the American dream, as you were saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and sanity. Yeah. yeah. Um, so first, my definition. Usually, I don't work from definitions. The whole idea that the place to start is by defining something, <clears throat> because meaning is relational, you know. But in this case, I do kind of have a definition. Sanity is simply to be in reality. For example, the reality of what a human being is here for. Um, as for like the reenchantment, the most important principle that I hold for the campaign is authenticity. And I, I really do admire. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, for his authenticity and, and his courage. Um, he's not going to tell people what they want to hear. He's not calculating like that. He does understand the necessity of speaking in their language, but not to the point where it compromises his truth. And so he'll tell people what they don't want to hear, what they don't like. And... Um, you know, then at least people are actually, that's respecting someone's sovereignty. You know, they're actually making an informed choice then. So, and I think that that is actually where re-enchantment comes from. Because how can you be enchanted by something when you have to maintain a cynical distance from it, you know? This is a long line here. I'm starting to get kind of tired. What time is it? But we still have... Yeah, we'd like a little bit more water. Thanks. Yeah. So nobody, no, no more people add to the line, okay? Just... Hello. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hypothetically, you, say, had a minute or two to speak a few phrases or such to the whole world. Every human in modernity and maybe even those still living originally. What would you love to share? Maybe from the heart. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, because I'm, I'm very fond of quoting Thoreau's statement, it takes two to speak the truth one to speak and one to hear. And what is, you know, words are a vehicle for truth. And the words that might be true for one person are not true for another person. So I don't have like a general universal formula. Um, and I could say something that everybody might agree with, you know, like what I said about the purpose of the human being but is that really what I want to say to that person right now? Mm. When their, their, you know, dog just died? Or when, like, you know, what is right to say to somebody depends on the relationship. And so here I am speaking to 400 people, but I have a sense of you. You know, my, my, I'm, I'm, that's why I, I have a lot of trouble giving speeches on the internet. I have to make a lot more of an effort to tune in to who's listening. 
So, yeah. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Grand. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Charles, when you were 10 years old, author Tom Wolfe called the 1970s the me decade. I don't know if you remember that. In fact, the BBC did a whole documentary series on the last century calling it the century of the self. So if we fast forward 50 years to today, when everybody has a podcast, including people in the systems change world, um, I find it equally amusing and disturbing when somebody like Aubrey Marcus comes out of an ayahuasca ceremony. The first thing he does is turn a camera on himself and record this. Um, for everybody out there. So my question comes from the famous modern philosopher Marcel the Shell. Remember Marcel the Shell? Became very popular during the pandemic. And Marcel in his movie, uh, the theatrical version, said, all of the people on YouTube, I thought I had a community. What I had was an audience. And that's my question for you. In this modern world of systems change? Are we creating community or are you guys just getting an audience? Um, I'd say it's more an audience. Yeah. There, there's, there's a role for that kind of relationship. Um, but there's an awful lot that cannot be accomplished that way. And I think most of the important work that needs to be done today cannot be done in that way. It's uh, on a much smaller scale and it is, involves physicality. And yeah, especially the idea that you're gonna have a bigger impact if you reach more people needs to be questioned. You can make big waves on the ocean surface that way and get a lot of likes, you know, and a lot of views. But that's not how to change the deep currents. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there. I first want to thank you and everyone else who showed up today. This has really been awesome. Um, one of the things that you were talking about that uh, rang for me was about the alternative kind of uh, community or mindset of creating uh, uh, of this intention. And you said it's not it's not intention, it's not, you don't create it, it's about making choices. And so kind of what came to my mind was some of the Mesoamerica spirituality that I've studied where they talk about dreams and that what we're living in right now is a collective dream that someone had, many people had, and we joined it. And so for me, I, and I want to ask you to speak to this, it's really about dreaming a new dream. What's my dream every day that I want to see? And that's, that's the way that I move forward. Yeah. It's a good question, where do dreams come from? Most traditional cultures have an idea of dreams as being sent to you. It's not the, uh, you know, conceit of the me decade and the cult of the individual that we create our dreams, that there's some machination of our unconscious mind, uh, you know, resetting the brain and whatever, um, but that dreams come from an external source. Same with visions. A, an authentic vision is not one that you make up. It's, 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 that's implicit in the word. Something you see. Yeah. But you do have choice within a dream. Oh, very much so. Especially yes. in this type of community dream. Yes. The collective dream. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a very fruitful metaphor. Yeah. Very fruitful way to understand it. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hi, Charles. I'm Zen, and you may not know it yet, but we're working together on the campaign. And I'm waiting for you to respond to my emails. <laughs> <laughs> and approve the messaging because we're going to be inviting people to join into 4th of July parades to raise awareness about Bobby Kennedy running for president. And we hope that you will all join in in Hendersonville and other local parades. And, um, and if you want to find out more about that and the fundraiser on October 28th, we invite everybody to go to the Unity Web, theunityweb.com, right? Dot com, Maura? Dot com. And that, Maura helps start. And we will let you know more about the parades and about the fundraiser. We need people to partner with us on this. Okay, guys? And my question for you, one of the banners that we're proposing that we hold as we walk through and reach thousands locally and millions nationally in a single day is Heal the Divide. So I would like to hear more from you about what can we do on a daily basis starting right now to heal the divide? Uh, yeah. Um, I said a bit about it before um, about holding anger sacred and not channeling it into hate. Um, I would maybe also then speak of the habit of judgment, which is the kernel of division on the interpersonal level. And what do I mean by judgment? Something very specific, which is the belief that if I were in your situation, I would not do as you have done. In other words, I'm better than you. Or I'm worse than you. But if I were in that situation, I, I wouldn't. If I were driving down that, that neighborhood road, I wouldn't be speeding. I wouldn't do that. If I were that father, I wouldn't be abusing that woman, that, that child, I would not. Why? Because I'm made of better stuff. That judgment writ large has completely taken over our civic culture. And it leads us to blame the horrible people on the other side for every problem. You know, and, and the Conservatives blame the liberals and vice versa, and you know, everybody blames everybody else. And it, it, it comes from that fundamental misunderstanding um, that, in fact, you know, the, the, the truth is that if I were in the totality of that person's circumstances, I might very well do exactly as they did. How do I know? And once you realize that, the next step is curiosity about what are those circumstances and how can I change them? What, why, why is there child abuse happening in a third of all households now? Why? What happened to the abusers who started out as adorable little babies who want nothing more than to love their own children? What happened to them? Once we start asking that question, then all kinds of new responses arise. And if we start asking that about, on a political level, those who we judge, you know, like the conservatives who judge immigrants, do they really know why, what, what makes somebody so desperate to leave their homeland? that they would risk their lives, put their, put, give all their money to these coyotes, you know, who put them in the back of a tractor trailer. And, I mean, what would, how desperate, what would it take for you to do that? You know, and once you start asking those questions, the simple answer, the simple solution of prevailing over the bad guys is no longer available and we're left with complexity, we're left with bewilderment, we're left with not knowing what to do, which is a very good start. Charles, uh, thank you for your presence, and I know I'm the last one and keeping everybody from your refreshments, so thanks for your presence, everybody. Um, 
I'm going to start with the question, but I do want to provide context selfishly for a little catharsis. And it's a Bhagavad Gita question about duty. And I would like for you just to generally talk about the tension I will transmit right now. This is cathartic because this tension was awoken in me when I read The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. And I'm sure you get this all the time, but I have this really weird relationship with you and your work because it, it made me start to question so much. It daylit what was being questioned already. I work a corporate job making cities greener with the green revolution that happens to extract lithium and bring it into EV cars because that's the technological promise of tomorrow. I do that because I want to put food on the table. And I do that because in the reality where we're all heading towards destruction, that's actually pretty good work for us to be doing to keep the planet survivable. And at the same time, I feel like dropping off the map. And I'm so privileged and I'm so tortured. And it's not just me, there's so many people my age and in these situations where they feel like they're kind of doing the right thing for this timeline, but they really want to be healers in the new timeline. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but my body can't handle the two right now. And it really is like a Bhagavad Gita duty thing in me. So anything that you can offer is wonderful. And thank you again for your work. Wow. Thank you for entrusting me with that question. Yeah, you, your, your body is an unusually finely tuned, exquisite instrument that is absorbing information that your mind has not grappled with. You know the fairy tale of the princess and the pea? Usually interpreted as some misogynistic story about the princess who is so delicate in particular she can't sleep when there's a pea under 20 layers of mattresses on her bed. Actually, though, the story really, the meaning is that the true princess will not tolerate anything wrong, even if it's buried under 20 layers of comfort. In the fairy tale, she shows up at the castle gates in a storm. She's, she's no delicate flower. That's established in the story, if you read it carefully. Okay, your body's telling you something. And that doesn't mean quit your job right now. All I'm saying is take that information seriously. Your idea of duty is sometimes a mechanism to override the information that your body's telling you. Your mind is seizing on duty to maintain the status quo. I'm getting a little bit out of batteries. Did someone just say I'm out of batteries? Yeah. <laughs> My batteries are getting a little low. This, the mic is fine, though. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, I haven't been doing so much public speaking, you know, after COVID. And, and um, I'm happy to be doing this tonight and to 
to be, um, you know, the uh, antenna for the collective consciousness in this room. That's part of why I'm here, to serve in that way. Um, you know, and to be able to say these things that aren't always appropriate to say to America in general in the context of a political campaign. But I know if I don't say them, then some channel in my energetic body will get blocked. So I want to thank you for giving me the generous listening to hear what, I, what is within me to say and to pull it through me through your listening. Um, and I will continue. I, I, I mentioned the Sanity Project, um, in which, as often, Patsy will do most of the work um, in organizing the team, running the website, uh, all, I mean, so much logistics. And my role will be to um, often sometimes every day, sometimes several times a week, offer little pieces, the kind of things I've been saying tonight, provocations, inspirations, uh, invitations, little videos, things like that, and sometimes longer things, um, maybe sometimes with guests, uh, Bio Komalafe and Orland Bishop have agreed to join me in this exploration of sanity. So if you're interested in that and, and as kind of a way to continue um, and have a, a, a drip line of the energy um, of our gathering tonight, then um, subscribe to my Substack, and I will announce the Sanity Project pretty soon. Is that right, Patsy? Yeah. All right, why don't you come up here? No. Okay. Hello? Okay. Hi. 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 So I'm just a hen. Hen, you know, Game of Thrones. <laughs> the hand, right? Okay. Um, so the, uh, the uh, Sanity Project, the program itself, is scheduled to go live on uh, uh, June 11th at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so that's when we're going to push the button and have it go live. Um, so as far as like registration goes, our website developer is working on it because it's, it's going to be a complex uh, of uh, passage to come in because we're using Mighty Network uh, and and you know Charles's model is by uh, gifts so Mighty Network does not offer that you know we have to put a price tag and we're unwilling to do that so we have to come up with a clever way to go around so uh, yeah bear with us uh, in the next couple of weeks or so we should open up the registration um, and yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. Oh, so, while I'm here, I, I want to say something that it would be helpful for you to know. That Charles said that he will provide uh, content like a drip line to uh, provide us this information. And so how, would, how the Sanity Project would run well is that if we can hold each other's hands and uh, do like practice group. So uh, the team that Charles was mentioning that I'm uh, organizing are a group of facilitators that will start offering that uh, as like practice sessions and it will, uh, sh it would happen th uh, through uh, Zoom modalities. But we definitely encourage you because you're all like uh, local people, you can organize your study group. Uh, so that is our hope that uh, through this sanity project, we can help people connect and maintain our sanity. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we're, yeah. The the gift model is basically we set a price and then you decide if that's too much or too little. Um, 
And, you know, because everybody's financial circumstance is different and your feeling of gratitude and value is different. So that's how we do it, kind of like tonight, you know. I think it was $25, but if you want to pay more or less, that's welcome as well. Um, and one last thing about the Sanity Project, it's actually for my sanity. <laughs> because, as I said, if I don't express these things, not through the filter of another man, Mr. Kennedy, you know, who I do respect and admire, but, but I need to, to have a direct channel too um, for my sanity and to see it land and, 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 and get the feedback, you know, that says, okay, Charles, you're not crazy, you know, because we're receiving this and resonating. So thank you everybody for coming here tonight and reminding me that I'm not crazy by your presence here. Uh, or maybe we're all crazy together. <laughs> <laughs>